Sophie, I'll just do a quick bio. Sophie's the author of um, two works of fiction, two novels, Geography and Bird, and she also um, wrote a non-fiction book, Melbourne, as part of the City series. Um, she has worked in publishing and supported writers in this country for many years as the publisher, as the uh, editor of Mianjin, and until recently was the chair of the Australia Council's Literature Board. Um, she's the co-founder and deputy prayer uh, chair of the uh, really wonderful Stella Prize and so it's just such a delight to have her here today and she's here to talk about her latest book Warning, the story of Cyclone Tracy. Um, Warning is an incredible book and, and actually extremely timely um, and um, Sophie builds a really new narrative about a story that most of us, certainly those of us over a certain age, know about through um, a, a myriad of voices of people who experienced um, Tracy and these are all woven with interludes around questions of um, memory and history and gender and um, colonial legacies and racism and climate change and politics. It is really um, a delightful and incredible read. Um, Sophie, I'm going to ask you to begin by reading a short section. Um, maybe if you could introduce yep, it first. Okay. I'm going to read a, um, a bit about what happened to people after the eye of the cyclone, because that was when I think people thought things were pretty rough before the eye, but it was after the eye that they got here, things got even rougher. And I just really wanted to give people a sense. One of the reasons I wrote the book um, was to try and give you a sense about what what it's like to be in the centre of an event like this because I think in a time we talk so much about weather, well I certainly do, and a time of climate change we sometimes, I, d I don't want people to lose track of actually what it's like to be in the centre of, of, of one of these events because uh, it's a, a deeply human, well not just human, um, I also write a lot about animals but yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very intense experience. No one was, nor perhaps could they be, prepared for the ferocity of the returning winds. Winds that hadn't built up over, wind that hadn't built up over several hours as the first half of the cyclone had, but hit bang at over 200 kilometres an hour. The wind measure at the airport blew away as the wind speech, speed reached 217 kilometres an hour. Peter Spillett, who had survived the bombing of London and the Burma campaign, described Tracy as the most traumatic experience he'd ever had. Paula de Santos, who'd lived through the bombing of Darwin in 1942, found the experience comparable. It was perhaps even worse for those who had nothing to compare it to. For it was now, when the winds returned, that things tipped. Things to that point had been bad, they'd been indescribable, but now everything was untethered from the... At this point, everything was untethered from the world people knew. The Harvey's house lifted from its moorings and dropped again. Rattled buildings, buildings that had been shaken for hours, exploded into the night, evap evaporated into the air. Darwin slipped through the looking glass into a new kind of reality. A young policeman, Robert Bullock, actually says this, that he felt his sense of reality shift as the cyclone went on for what seemed like a lifetime. Sections of the roof at the Fanny Bay Watch House were blown off and prisoners were moved from Block 1 to Block 3. Ted D'Ambrosio's brother was out at the Darwin Golf Club and tied himself to a pillar to stop himself flying away. His son drove home in a small Mazda and when he, somewhat miraculously, made it home, he told his dad he'd seen caravans flying through the air over the Stewart Highway. Cedric Patterson's archival interview reads like a dreamscape, a dreamscape as he talks of his house slowly falling apart and the stars coming in. He saw, uh, this, uh, I, I quote, I'm quoting other people's words quite often through this. Um, he saw a piece of asbestos cement about the size of a dinner plate and it was just floating in the passageway. And he can remember brushing it out of the way with his hand and thinking, that's strange. He talks of hiding under the drawer and feeling dazed, of walls collapsing. Walls are, des walls are described as melting and one man described being sucked out of his roofless, roofless house as if he was riding a magic carpet. Shards of broken glass swirled around rooms as if in a giant blender. Everyone started making deals with God, even the atheists. Some people couldn't breathe, the wind was so ferocious. Elspeth Harvey, stuck in her car with her family in a menagerie of animals, was so desperate for a piss she held onto the car handle and had, quote, the fastest pee in the world. But while the door was open, her cat escaped. Petrol was sucked out of petrol tanks and air out of car tires. Houses rocked like boats at sea. People sheltering in cars were picked up into the air, blown a few hundred metres and then dumped again. 
bead curtains, all the rage in the early 70s, whipped through the air like stock whips. One woman was blown out of the house with her five-month-old son in her arms. They landed uninjured, but the baby was so cold that instinct drove the mother to lick him, much as a cat would, in an effort to keep him warm. Another mother remembers being blown three blocks from her house with her young daughter in her arms, and the two of them spinning like feathers through the air. Housing girders swept them, um, twisted themselves into forms of abstract beauty. Thousands of sheets of corrugated iron scraped and scratched along the ground, sounding like millions of fingernails running down a blackboard. Ordinary household objects became lethal. Sergeant, Sim Sergeant, Sergeant Simpson remembers, I was st struck on the left, left shin by a china mug and the handle became embedded, embedded in my leg. And a refrigerator wedged itself into the high water tank near the airport. At the Wright's house, things became less ferocious after the eye because everything had already blown away. Arthur hugged Pat until dawn, saying, it's all right, love, don't worry, just stay here with me. 28-year-old barrister Tom Pauling, a lover of theatre and already sporting the flamboyant moustache that would survive Tracy and many decades beyond, played to type by taking to the Corvusia VSOP cognac. David McCann, the city's magistrate, sat in the YMCA with a mattress on his head. Richard Creswick, a journalist, sat in the bath with three cats, a dozen tinnies and a bottle of something strong and taught his, horse, his housemate Eric the words to waltzing Matilda. At some point, Creswick began to crawl towards his bedroom to, to grab his duffel coat, only for lightning, a lightning flash to reveal the bedroom had been blown away. Over in Night Cliff, dentist Howard Truen narrowly missed being impaled by a 30-foot piece of timber with a pointy end, like a javelin that was flying through the air. It went through the ceiling above him and then stopped four feet from where he and his wife were lying. He believes his wife's crucifix had protected them from being speared. He actually converted to Catholicism after the... <laughs> um, the palm in the botanical gardens that was about to flower for the first time in 100 years that Christmas Day was destroyed. Okay. Thanks. Fantastic. So, Sophie, if we could begin with you talking a little bit about um, where you found these voices and these <coughs> stories from. Yes, yeah, so I didn't know, when, when I decided I wanted to write the book, I didn't know about the Northern Territory Oral his History Archives. And it was when I went up to Darwin to, to begin research that I discovered these. And I ended up reading hundreds, there, there exist hundreds of interviews with people that were done anything from three weeks after the cyclone until, you know, 2002, I think, were the more recent ones. <coughs> and reading those interviews allowed me to just get so many different perspectives on what happened to really build up a kind of soundscape, if you like. I, I got a really strong sense of what had happened and that allowed me to then go off and do other research um, to kind of find out more details that weren't, details that weren't tackled in, in, in when people recounted their personal stories. But the, the way they spoke about what happened to them was so extraordinary and so moving that I decided I wanted to, in fact, write the whole book using their voices as a kind of guide. So I, I quote, there's probably about 20 recurring characters, if you like, even though they're real people, that um, I just use all, all the way through the book. And some of them I also then went and interviewed myself as well as, as, using, as using the archives. But I couldn't have written the book, really, without, without that resource. Without those, those stories. And so you met some of those people? Yeah, um, most significantly one of the police. I, very early on, um, the woman who ran the... Um, ran the reading room, suggested I read police reports. And these weren't um, official police reports. These were policemen were required to write down what had happened to them during the, the night in case there was an inquiry into their um, capacity to police. So they wrote in these very kind of... It, very blunt language what had happened to them. And it was kind of phrases like... Them, my wife and I put our children between our bodies. My son was blown from my arms. He held onto the door handle. I managed to get to him. Our roof flew off. And then the next day, he, these people, men, would usually men, in fact, they were almost all men, would go to work and be expected to work in morgues or, or, or to find bodies. And they were under the most extraordinary pressure. So I did you, start with those police reports and I interviewed um, a couple of the policemen separately, um, particularly a man called Bill Wilson who um, went on to become the Assistant Commissioner of Police in the Northern Territory and then went on to become a historian, in fact. Yeah. Um, 
I'd like to uh, go back a little bit. One of the things about the book, I, I, I did live in Darwin for some time and not during the cyclone, and a lot of people talk about what happened on the night and indeed you've read from it and there is an important section where you talk about that, but um, it's the stories afterwards really in the aftermath of, of the cyclone that this book deals with. But to really understand that, I wonder if you can just give us a sort of snapshot of what Darwin was like the day before Christmas? It, um, the population was about 45,000 people um, and but those figures are rubbery because a lot of people went home for Christmas and home being other states and so no one really knows how many people were in Darwin when, when the cyclone hit which is one reason why people don't, there's a lot of questioning of various figures people going missing, how many people were evacuated, those those kind of things. Most of the pop, the white population were public servants who had often only lived in the town for five, five years or so. Um, most of those people were under 28 and it was a bit of a party town and people loved, loved living there. But um, there also were people who'd been, um, Anglo people who'd been living there for several generations. Chinese Australians had been living there since the 1880s. Um, and obviously um, a large indigenous community as well. And it is a town that had been destroyed and rebuilt. Yeah, there was a massive before. cyclone, I think, in the 1890s, but obviously it was a much smaller town. There was a very big cyclone in, I think, 1937, and then Cyclone Tracy. So it, since um, non-Indigenous people have been living in the area, there had been three cyclones that had, had wiped Darwin out. But, of course, in a way more significantly, in terms of people's memories, there had been the bombing of Darwin. So a lot of the people, which was in 41, 42, sorry, I've um, gone slightly blank. Two. Yeah. Um, and so a lot of the women, older women who were evacuated after um, Cyclone Tracy had also been evacuated during the bombings. Mm. So now uh, I would like you to um, take us to Christmas morning and what it was like once the horror of the cyclone had passed, what it was like for people waking up that morning. It was, um, I'm thinking I might actually read a tiny bit about that. It, quite a few people described it as walking out as if, as if a bomb had wiped out the city and described it as being like Hiroshima. I, I remember when I first started reading that I felt people must be exaggerating, but the more, more I, I learned and the more photos I saw, I realised that they weren't exaggerating. That it was, I think 90% of the buildings in the northern suburbs were destroyed. Uh, across the city overall, it was about 70% of the city was um, destroyed. And um, people totally, quite a few people talk about how they just lost their moorings, literally. There's no street signs. Um, people couldn't even find their, if they were in evacuation centres or they'd spent the night with a friend, they couldn't work out how to get back to their house. So they might think that relatives or friends were dead or family were dead because they couldn't find family, in fact, that family might be fine. And a lot of people talked about how terrifying it was to try and get home to find out or home didn't actually exist and then not knowing what had, what had happened to other people. Um, there were no phones. No one outside Darwin knew what had happened. And I do write a bit about comparing that to what would happen today with um, when cyclones descend or bushfires. Social media and radio play quite a big role, but the, the, all the, the radio transmitters had disappeared at midnight. So n the radio didn't come back for two days. Um, and a lot of a lot of people actually describe also felt that they were in their house with their house being rip, ripped apart around them that it was only happening to them and they were just having really bad luck and then they when they stepped out of their house what was left of their house the next morning they realized that the whole town had gone but this kind of vacuum of communication the fact that people couldn't really cars didn't have petrol in them that there was so much um, you know glass and everything everywhere that tires would get shredded so it was really hard to drive it might take an hour to drive what would normally take 10 minutes so people became isolated other than the people very immediately around them and a lot of rumors kind of started very quickly that the cyclone was coming back and well various other other rumors which I go into in, in um, the, the people became extremely anxious about looting. 
and talked about an epidemic of looting. And while there was some looting, in fact, the number of arrests was pretty low given the level of anxiety about it. Um, pe there was a, people say that there were people being shot in the streets. I only found a couple of people who said that they saw that the police denied that there were. So there are a lot of stories. One of the things I try and look at is how everyone's version is a bit different. Yeah. And I don't always try and get to the truth of the matter. Sometimes I do. But sometimes I after th three years I abandoned that as impossible and just tried to talk about why there might be such a gap in people's perceptions. And also about the fact that if people believe certain things have happened, that's really important and that's their experience effectively. Mm. Um, I know we're going to talk about the evacuation later, but this that gap between what may or may not have really happened was particularly important. A lot of women believed they were forced out of town and said they had guns held to their head to kind of get them to go on planes. Um, I didn't actually find evidence of that level of um, coercion. But certainly people felt under that, women felt under that much pressure to get out. Yeah. Um, well, maybe we will go on to the um, evacuation then. Do you want to read a okay. short section about that? And then we'll talk about the Darwin refugees. Just to, um, yeah, to introduce the evac... They, again, the, the numbers became very rubbery, but they decided they had to get the town, the population down to 10,000 in a week. So people were... It was very chaotic to get out, but between 20 and 25,000 people out that quickly. Out that quickly. Mm -hmm. um, the scenes are incredibly chaotic, chaotic, lots of people on buses, lots of people waiting um, at the RAF, um, you know, the, uh, along the t on the tarmacs and, and waiting for planes, people being um, shipped all over the place saying that they had family in Perth but ending up in, not in Broome, but, you know, in Sydney. And, and it was just really, and only, of those that maybe 20,000 or 25,000 that were evacuated, only half of them ever came back to Darwin. A lot of them, a lot of them chose never to return. And that's, I think, uh, what really struck struck me. I mean, I think in Adelaide, if you, the, those of us from Adelaide remember, like um, like you do, Sophie, the mm. the images of the um, Darwin evacuees arriving at Adelaide Airport, and I remember starting school in February with all the new kids um, at the school who'd arrived from Darwin with without their without their fathers but what I didn't really understand till I read your book is the impact of those fractured families that never reunited again yeah I'll, um, and Adelaide did actually bear the brunt of quite a lot of, of the evacuation um, there um, the statistics of, of um, mental illness and all kinds of things of those who were evacuated were very high but um, I'll maybe talk about that yeah. later. 20 years after Tracy, Elizabeth Carroll describes landing in Sydney with nothing but a man's shirt on and feeling like a refugee. Wendy James suggested something similar when she talks of experiencing the indignity and disruption of refugees. Carroll believes she was given no choice. I really wish we could have stayed because we would have got there, we would have made it, we would have rebuilt. It was so traumatic and so hard splitting the families and trying to start a new life. Her kids were traumatised for years and used to vomit whenever she spoke at the cyclone. Carol herself has never returned to, been able to return to Darwin and you, when you read her interview the pain and distress she felt years afterwards are palpable. Janice Perrin ended up staying in Canberra for two years after she was evacuated. Like many evacuees she never returned to Darwin and like many evacuees she, she saw her marriage end. Warren had a lot of trouble settling and a lot of trouble sticking with the decision. He would decide he'd come back to Darwin and he actually came back and then he sort of went to Alice Springs. He had an injury in his foot from flight from flying glass that never properly healed. Carol acknowledges that there were many separations and divorces after the cyclone, but her marriage stayed intact. Julia Church's experience is typical in some ways. The evacuation was a second unwanted immigration hot on the heels of the family's initial move to, from England, because a lot of people chose to move to Darwin. They were kind of very willing immigrants to that, to there. Moving to Canberra was incredibly hard, particularly for her parents. It was like going back to the beginning, immigrating all over again, but they were middle-aged, not young. Now in her early 50s, Julia is a renowned printmaker who lived in Italy for many years, but she still feels the loss of Darwin as a home. And when we meet in a cafe in Canberra that feels as far away from Darwin as it's possible to be, we're both struck by how hard she finds it to even talk about Tracy and what happened after. Every detail seems significant and painful. Each represents the moment her life changed irrevo irrevocably. 
She keeps apologising for this and seems to have a sense that she's making too much of how difficult things, things were. But you're not, I tell her. The archives and newspapers are full of people with stories like yours. Everyone talks of a pain they find, find hard to define. Um, she goes on to talk about being put on an aircraft jet where they, um, everyone's just sat on the floor because there's no seats. The kids, are, they're on the plane for eight hours people are pissing everywhere and they just had bananas thrown at them at key points for food and she said they sat there filling up monkeys. I won't read more because there's so many of these there's kind so of many. stories yeah. but um, maybe significantly I should mention quite a lot of people got separated and um, took them two or three weeks to find their spouse or their parent because they would end up in one city and, and, and um, someone else would end in another and there weren't, weren't proper records kept for the first couple of days, the record record keeping did improve, which meant that people just had no way of finding out what had happened to anyone. Mm. People just stood at the airport, this happened in Adelaide, yeah. waiting to see if, if their friends or family got off a plane. Or they were there Perth for a week. or Brisbane yeah. or could end up in any random places. The other thing that had never occurred to me till I read this book is the, um, the kind of surrealness of the, uh, the, 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 the process that says after that sort of disaster send all the women away you, you know that that the response was to empty out a town of women and children that was one of the things I was most shocked by I mean I knew that times were different back then but there was actually a sense that all the women had to be got out unless they had a very specific purpose um, say we're a nurse um, some of them actually were desperate to get out but Though quite a few women didn't want to be separated, particularly from their partners or from the, um, the children were also sent out. Um, the fear was that um, cholera and typhus and those kind of things would hit. Um, I would, and I argue in the book, that immunisation would have been a quicker, like you, you could have um, dealt with those kind of things and certainly disease didn't, didn't strike. But the long-term impact of that was that... Um, women felt useless they didn't get to be part of rebuilding the community and um, people certainly cope a lot more with that kind of trauma and did cope a lot better if they could be part of rebuilding something and so the people that coped best with what happened to them in cyclone tracy were the people that spent you know were there for several years after and were part of of, of um helping the city turn into something new and, and and a kind of rebirth but if they're sort of stuck in a hostel and then staying with relatives and spending a year or two even getting the money together and their, their husband may or may not be with them and and a lot of marriages actually ended in this time it's just like their lives just suddenly ended and they were treated as as um they were told, and, and, and the um, various people I quote, various um, senior um, men that I quote just said that they wouldn't have coped. And a lot of men also say that they were having to work such long hours. They were working 20 hours a day in the week after, trying to clean things up, that they didn't want their wives hanging off them, is a quote of one person. Um, when in fact they would have been, there would have been plenty of things that they could have and indeed, indeed wanted to do. So it was very demoralising. Yeah. Um, with the, the, the use of these stories, um, there's a lot of, uh, I think you get a really strong sense of the physical place, both the responses to the built environment and the nat natural environment and the kind of, I guess, really dramatic sensory shift that yeah. happened from before to after. Yeah. A lot of people talk about the smells and the sounds and those kind of things. It is an amazing town. I, mean, I assume a lot of people here have, have been there and it's very sensual in that in that way. Um, and it was... Ch it, one of the things you asked earlier what Darwin was like, there weren't many trees, ironically, in Darwin, because now if you go there, you see it's incredibly tropical feeling. Um, and that was partly response to the cyclone. People were so saddened by all the trees, all the kind of, all the palms and everything just being stripped and all the birds disappeared for a year. Everyone talks about the birds disappearing and how strange it felt not to have, have bird song. And so people were very keen to, um, try and reintroduce that and, and, and in fact one woman very, the botanical expert George Brown used to would drive around and give people trees and there would kind of be lines for pe who, people who wanted to get, get trees from him and um, people, lots of nursery sprung up and people became really obsessed 
with the physical environment. So, in, so some people believe it's a nicer town now than it was, but it's a more bureaucratic. Well, it's a bigger town, so it's a different town. Some of those changes would have happened anyway, mm. and it's very—it's probably quite hard for people to really know how much is the cyclone. And mm. but there's a lot of talk among people about whether they preferred it before or after. Women preferred it after. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, you say in your book, history is never just history, and weather is never just weather. Um, it brings up a lot of really fascinating questions about. We've touched on the sort of gendered, uh, you know, responses to uh, mm. to disaster, but also around um, racial politics and mm. and what was happening with the Larrakia people at the time. Yeah, one of my motivations in writing, and I'd read a couple of books about Cyclone Tracy. I've always been fascinated with it. Is that no one um, wrote about the Indigenous experience and I really wanted to make that part of the book and um, and I did come to understand that there were certain reasons why it was hard to write about that is um, in, the, in the oral histories with, um, lo with local Larrakia people they were much more private about deaths and how they'd felt about what happened to them they um, rather than giving lots of detail it was sort of not there's, you know, they would say things like, that's not my story, I can't tell you that bit. So I've, um, I'd finally spent the day with a guy who was from a local family. He was, he's one of the, um, he's not an official elder, he's the son of one of the elders of, of Darwin. And I was trying to get to know him, this man. And I said, oh, well, here's the weather. Because every time I went there to experience a wet season, it never rained. <laughs> So I'd, I'd be there, I was there for about three Januaries in a row and it would either start raining in February or it hadn't rained at all. And so, <laughs> um, and I did say to him, do you think the weather's changing? And he just, he sort of just didn't look at me, he didn't say anything. And I said, well, you know, do you believe in climate change? And he just looked at me and said, we just don't like to talk about the weather like you do. And, that's just, and I think I realised that his point was that weather is serious. You don't just chat about it. It's not just light conversation. Um, it's a kind of profound elemental force and, and, and unless you treat it with respect, it's not... But actually, it wasn't just Indigenous people in the end who ended up saying that. Quite a few people said they became superstitious about talking about it because they didn't want to bring in... White people were saying this as well, that they might bring back a cyclone. But I did end up... Um, trying to look at um, weather events in various kind of key um, Larrakia stories um, and which ended up taking me to the art of Rover Thomas and his paintings of the cyclone and um, the art community in Turkey Creek, which effectively, um, to cut a story going to some detail in the book, is that, 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 com that art community grew out of paintings of Cyclone Tracy. Um, the amazing paintings of, some of you might know it from the National Gallery in Canberra, that kind of, the painting called Cyclone. And that community got almost wiped out in floods in 2011, and a lot of the art was almost lost. And um, people thought that so it was going to be a weather event that ended that community as well. I actually think they've managed to, to pull it together. But I did. So I did. Um, I also looked at there, there was. The other impact was land rights. So land rights were starting to simmer away as a big issue. Um, and some people believe that Cyclone Tracy meant it became even more potent because for complicated reasons. One is that the local white people actually felt a sense of place they hadn't felt before. They suddenly realised they felt rebonded with Darwin and they felt more invested in whether land was given back to the local people or not. It sort of became more of an issue that they wanted to get involved in. Some were supportive and some weren't. Um, it, actually, one thing I haven't mentioned is that one of the reasons why the evacuation was so terrible was that once you were evacuated out, you couldn't necessarily get back in. So a lot of people couldn't get it back in for six or nine months. Um, you had to have a permit and there are examples of men being asked if they wanted their wives to come back, for example, and you know they wouldn't always give the answer the wife wanted, so they ended up not coming back at all. Um, I mean that, that was not a bureaucratic process; that was sort of informal kind of thing. But the other thing is, you had to be able to say that you had a house that was functional that you could that you could live in. And a lot of the indigenous people living in communities around Darwin hadn't ever had a house that was functional. So they couldn't say, yeah, I've got a house in Nucky Creek, because they'd never had a house in Nucky Creek. 
and so they felt that they were being particularly targeted in terms of kept out of the town and like a lot of racism I don't think it was particular targeting but just that the law was so clueless about the impact it, it was going to have on that community and um, while in the immediate aftermath of the cyclone and a lot of Indigenous people say they felt more a part of Darwin than they had before because everyone was in it together and there was lots of free food and a very strong sense of community, in the long term they felt it took a lot longer for money to get back to those communities to um, rebuild them. Yeah. That was the most complicated thing in the book really was trying to kind of track down a, a lot of this information. Um, there's a section too that I um, was really fascinating for me around, I guess, the 12 months following Cyclone Tracy at a federal, at a, at a national level, and the number of extraordinary changes that were enacted over that year, the legislation of the Whitlam government, and then ending in November the, the, the following year. And, you know, there is a very tantalising argument that, you know, people have, have make all over the world uh, that natural disasters, massive natural disasters and political change can 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 be close together. I know you interviewed Malcolm Fraser who wanted you to resist um, yeah. that argument. Yeah, yeah no, in the year 1975, so it was Gough, Gough Whitlam's final year, um, the Land Rights Act, it didn't actually get formally enacted till the 76, but it, it certainly went to Parliament. Um, gay rights were enacted in, in South Australia. The, uh, informally, they started using Advance Australia Fair as the national anthem. Um, I think capital punishment got um, the death penalty was repelled. The, 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 I have a list of about 20 things that happened. It was an, and and um, the Northern Territory um, government got more legislative autonomy in in, in 76, I think, or 70, early 77. And so I developed a theory that um, the cyclone had changed everything in, um, in, in Australia, not just in Darwin. And uh, one of the um, interesting things about this book was trying to find people I could talk to about it. Gough Whitlam was extremely ill and I couldn't talk to him. Um, Jim Cairns, who was a significant political figure in the, in the weeks after, spent a lot of time in Darwin, um, had died. Most people I needed to speak to had died, so I turned to Malcolm, who, um, whose government oversaw the rebuild and, and honoured the um, commitments the Whitlam government had made in terms of financial support, and asked him, and he, he didn't like my theory. He said that he thought that a lot of these changes were um, in play anyway. Um, but people in Darwin absolutely believe that things like greater autonomy, legislative autonomy, was because of, um, and, and, and the uh, moving forward with land rights were because of what happened with the cyclone. And when I uh, did a reading where I talked about Malcolm Fraser saying that, um, you know, he didn't actually think it had made much of a difference in that, in that kind of political sense, there was a lot of muttering in the crowd. <laughs> people didn't, didn't agree with that at all. Yeah. I'd like to flip now to... Uh, to you and your experience of writing this book, particularly as a novelist, and particularly there were um, obviously personal things going on in terms of your relationship with Darwin mm. and your father being there. And it's very, um, a lot of it is about memory and the slipperiness of memory and the bringing all of these voices and stories and memories together. What was it like for you as a, as a novelist to, to work these into this non-fiction narrative? Well, I think one, one of the things I realised really quickly was that finding out the truth of what happened, for example, how many people really died, just to give one example, I was never going to find that out. There were so many different versions, there were so many different documents that contradicted each other. Um, and while you could come up with a view that something probably happened, it was the timeline was incredibly difficult. I mean, General Stretton's timeline contradicted some of the other senior players' timelines. Their diaries said different things. So I very quickly learned how slippery the facts are, let alone people's memory of, of what happened. And what research I did on memory and and people have talked about this specifically when you were with working with the oral histories is that the way people lose any sense of time almost everyone said i can't remember if i was evacuated the day after or four days after i can't remember how long my wife was away 
I can't remember how long I was on on my back under corrugated iron. Um, it, because pe- partly because people weren't sleeping, so people quite a few people worked for four or five days straight. I mean, um, paramedics, um, trying to people who were trying to clean up rubbish, um, and then left and quite a few of the, um, these people ended up having minor breakdowns. A lot of these people were men and men actually talked to me also just to get back to our early topic about how traumatised they were about the women being removed. They didn't necessarily want all the, all the women removed. But um, so I did start to think a lot about memory and, and, and what it does um, and how sure people would be in particular things that happened when it seemed fairly likely that they hadn't happened. And um, at the same time, my father developed dementia and was receiving treatment in Darwin. He lives in Indonesia. And so it was just slightly confronting to kind of... Uh, I would be spending time in Darwin with him working on the book and just seeing how his memory would be triggered by particular meals or, or particular you know, sights and sounds was just kind of a strange coming together, really, of, of my, my preoccupations. But um, one of the things that was most personally moving for me was actually after the book came out and I went back to Darwin to promote the book. Um, this is in August last year when the book came out and I did an event at Darwin Library, just a free event. About 30 people came and I, I talked about the book like I'm talking to you about the book. But um, at, in question time things became very... A lot of people stood up and just started telling, saying, I haven't ever spoken about this, but this is what happened to me. Some people were angry with me because I hadn't spoken to them personally and, and felt that I hadn't represented their story. They hadn't read the book, but they just felt not listened to. And what has struck me whenever I've spoken about it was how painful it is still for people. 40, so it's a, a little bit as if it happened yesterday. So it's not just about memory, it's about time being elastic. So some things just seem to have happened ages ago and really for a lot of people it just it had never gone away or it had gone away and was coming back as, as, as they got older. And that was really, it was very moving and, and, and sad. Yeah, and I guess they were preparing them for the 40th commemoration. Yes, um, this was probably the first thing that, that happened. I didn't actually plan to write the book for the 40th, uh, but it just took me much longer to write than I thought it would. It was probably about the 35th, I think, by the, when I started it. Really, that long? No, it was four years, actually, not five. But, and how long yeah. did you actually spend in the archives with those...? I probably spent... Over four years, about four to six weeks a year in Darwin in the archives. And um, I mean, I'd thought, planned to spend more time in Darwin, but a lot of the people had moved. A lot of, a lot of, a lot of people find living there, um, people who are not from Darwin, the heat does get to them at a certain point. So a lot of people were actually living in New South Wales or Victoria. So the, most of the, or Canberra, as with, in the case of Julia Church. So I ended up travelling all around Australia, not to Darwin, to do a lot of those interviews. Yeah, we are going to open it up for questions, seeing as we were yep. just talking about that. Yep. So in about five minutes, if you can make your way to the um, uh, microphone, I won't stop again unless I see someone there. Um, the title of the book, The Warning, you talk about it, obviously it has its obvious meaning, it's mm. the cyclone warning, but also it comes to the heart of, I guess, why you've chosen yeah. to write this book. Yeah. I mean, I've always had a fairly personal and extreme interest in the cyclone, one that I can't totally explain other than as a 10-year-old being horrified that all these children didn't get their presents. This just seemed unimaginable to me as, as a girl in Melbourne. But I'm also very interested in climate change and what's happening to the climate and I just wanted to write a story that was about that didn't actually talk a lot about climate didn't talk about climate change but talked about the weather and what it can do so when there is so much talk about the weather I thought it was really useful for people to actually just focus on what it is we're talking about when we talk about the weather and the warning is um, also became an issue, warnings became an issue because um, a lot of people blamed Darwinians for um, not being prepared and not listening to the warnings. But I think uh, most research shows that people often don't listen to warnings and frankly people could have done everything right and not gone to parties and 
the houses still would have blown away around them and they would have had a really tough time. So I'm not sure that the, when, when the building codes weren't adequate, there was going to be a limit to what warnings could do. Mm. Yeah. Is there a question? Um, not so much a question, but I was in Darwin two days, one flown in at the highest level, two days after the cyclone, and I absolutely was enthralled by your talk, and thank you very much. A lot of the... One thing you did not speak about was the spirit of Darwin, which mm. I found. I could add so much to what you're saying about the lack of women. I had my job to do, but I couldn't get around to do it because everywhere they saw a woman and begged me to do some typing. Everything in those days had to be typed. Telexes were all, I mm. think in those days, typed. Yes, mm. there certainly were no fax machines. Yes, we were still using telexes. I've just got it mm. straight. And no fax machines and certainly nothing modern. And it broke my heart to say, I did it once, but it mm. broke my heart to say, no, it is I can't. One of the things that struck me was that even if you have a very tr very traditional view of what women's roles are, there were plenty of traditional jobs that, were need that needed to be done, uh, as you're saying. Uh, so that's why one of the reasons why it's so bemusing that it was thought that women wouldn't have anything to contribute, because there were those kind of jobs that, and a lot of phone work and a lot of non-physical labour, which there weren't enough men, men to go around to do those jobs. Yes. I was working for the Women's Weekly at the time, which is how I got in on the status of the Women's Weekly in those days. The only other woman in the plane flying in was a top-level nurse. The plane was full of men flying in. But one thing about the spirit of Darwin, and I was stunned to hear about the guns, I saw nothing like that two days later. Perhaps that came after that. There was uh, a, a decree was, decree is a very dramatic word, but um, the police were told they had to shoot um, dogs because they would form packs and there was a lot of shooting of dogs in the street in front of people. So that definitely happened. I think what's less clear is whether people were shot. And I think they probably weren't. But I think there was a very strong spirit in Darwin in the immediate after aftermath. But about a year later, people were very worn down. The Women's Weekly did some of the best writing on the cyclone that I read. They, I did they, the first. Right. And uh, wonderful Kay Keaveney did the 75 story. Yes. Yeah, it was an, it was an amazing, um, amazing resource. So I, I, I used it a lot. So thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, thank you for your um, most in interesting um, talk and I'm looking forward to reading your book. Um, I want to raise the question that um, the whole thing about um, disasters is a very big issue in Australia and I come from a very bushfire prone part of mm. Victoria and I would say that probably when you have a bushfire, a very devastating bushfire, that the number of people who don't come back and don't rebuild is probably as great as it was in Cyclone Tracy. Um, I think the figures that are quoted are that in the short term, a third of the people don't rebuild or, or return to their normal lives. But in the long term, there's a similar figure that that takes quite a long time to work through because a certain amount of people go back but find they can't sustain being there and then eventually move on. And I'm just wondering about the whole uh, issue and, and whether you've thought about it is um, about how do we support people through these very traumatic events that have very long reaching effects? Certainly, um, I know after um, Black Saturday, this has come up a lot, um, particularly thinking of the, of the King Lake community. I think one of the answers is that you need long term support. And so it's great that a lot of, there's a lot of support in the week or two after an event, but actually it's as important that there's um, on that these things are ongoing, and I certainly in Victoria, there's a lot of promises are made to the communities affected by bushfires that then aren't honoured because you have a change of government or people run out of money, and um, so it's it's long-term support is 
the answer on. Yeah, because I think at the moment, when they talk long term, they talk about a year, two that's years, right. and that's really just a, a, the beginnings for many people. And I think it's about, um, I was reading figures, it's about there's some t amount of time after a disaster where um, people run out of adrenaline, or I mean, that kind of gets talk about in medical terms where people really crash. And it's more than a year. I mean, people can go a, more than a year, but then they often have a start to really struggle and this has been happening in Christchurch. Other things that can um, that do help are expediting insurance claims as opposed to slowing them down and um, one of the problems that hit um, Cyclone hit Darwin but I think it, it's affected other towns is that the planning process for the new town became incredibly drawn out so that people can't get their lives back on track for quite a few years and that, that also makes things a, a lot worse. The drama in Darwin was some people wanted to rebuild it so that that took the, so it would take a surge zone into account, and other people just wanted to build it exactly the way that it was. Mm. And you know, having lived in Darwin and been there through many rainy seasons, when it did in fact rain, um, and the cyclones come, the, the the talk of the surge zone is you know people. It, it's a very still a hot topic. Yes, you just today to say we calculate zone. where yeah. it comes going to come in, and you know where it's going to go out, and the strip of houses that are going to be knocked down. Because during Cyclone Tracy, there wasn't a very big surge because it wasn't high tide and mm. so therefore pe people said oh well the surge is not a big issue so there's another question yeah. oh, I just wonder if th those people who are here uh, who were there for Cyclone Tracy could perhaps indicate yeah. perhaps put up the hands or stand up or we have a get-together uh, surround you know in a group uh, at the end of this yes do we'll go and meet at the signing table. so were you in I yeah, was certainly experience. there on the day of Cyclone Tracy and there for three years before and one year after. And wow. uh, very many memories of it, yes. Do you mind me asking how old you were when it... That's a personal question, I know, because we can all do maths. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, yes, I was uh, 24, uh, coming up to 25. Right, and that means you would have been expected to do a lot of the kind of physical labour and the physical kinds of stuff that happened in the weeks after. I was a telecommunications technician. Oh, right. I installed and maintained all the television, the telephone exchanges, radio systems, and it was... Uh, uh, there was so much to repair after it. It was mind-boggling to have get the resources to get everything back up, uh, all the antennas put back up, and the uh, and and with the telephone exchange, that was one of the worst things. You said the telephones didn't work. That is because the roof got blown off the telephone exchange. They got water in, and at the bottom of a telephone exchange, at the bottom of the racks is the power supplies to power each of the racks. Well, that was all taken out. So even though most of the equipment was okay, there was just no power to power yeah. each of them. So it was a dramatic, uh, terrifying thing to try to. So we were working for 12. 15 15 hours a day. Yes. Yes. In fact, one of General Stretton talks about just caught when he first heard about it in Canberra. He called at was four in the morning in Canberra, so it was a little bit. No, it was about six in the morning in Canberra and a bit earlier in Darwin. And someone did actually pick up a phone, which confused everything. He said, "Oh no, everything's fine." But it was still dark, so in fact, the person who picked up the phone didn't really understand that things weren't fine mm -hmm. at all. Yeah. And then the phone stopped working. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I have another question. I was in uh, Darwin during Cyclone Tracy um, and I wondered whether you actually researched uh, the goings on in the hospital. With yeah, I the did read quite a lot. Did yes. you work at the hospital? Uh, yes, well I was a, a I worked there, I worked in blood transfusion there and I was only there shortly in the early stages and then the um, Red Cross came up from Adelaide and... Uh, yeah, no, there's a lot of... T I mean, I read a lot at, uh, about what happened in the hospital. The, the um, Charles Gerd, who was one of the... Um, yes. who, who mm. ran the hospital, and, and as well as being in charge of health policy, was very good at making sure that it was a relative... that, that they had evacuation... Not evacuation, yes. but they had emergency procedures Triage. and that they could keep working working through the cyclone. The fairly dramatic um, descriptions of the floors being covered in sort of yes. pink... Cause of 
blood and water. Yes. And there was one of the nurses had a baby in the middle of the cyclone, nurse Sister Anne, I think her name was. Well, I didn't hear yeah. that, but I <laughs> had <laughs> several babies <laughs> were born <laughs> around the time of the mm. cyclone, which, yes. must, which was obviously difficult. Yes. <laughs> we did have a friend who'd had a, a child, a baby, that night, and I think it was her husband was actually killed with a friend um, uh, on, on, during the cyclone. Well, so the, general, she, the, the general anaesthetist mm. of the hospital was killed on the night of the cyclone, yes, I know that. Too. Yes, yeah. and I, ha I do have a refugee card and I can assure you that not all women felt they were forced yeah. to go, that because we had young children, because the fear was that there'd be a, an epidemic of something, you felt obliged to go and you didn't know where you could end up. I was fortunate to get back to Adelaide to my parents. Um, and also, we, myself and, I, and my husband have had a long-standing, uh, ongoing relationship with Darwin ever since and uh, still work up there and go up there quite frequently. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Hi, um, I live in far north Queensland, um, so I was interested in what you were saying about um, uh, that now that buildings are built up to code um, and standards for building in these tropical areas, um, yes that's certainly I think helped with the level of damage that occurs in big um, events like Cyclones Larry and Yasi in particular. But, and I think we've just recently seen this in Rockhampton and Yapoon as well, that in these big events, even these days, it's the older housing stock that is most affected now. Mm -hmm. So when you see images of destroyed homes, they're always the older fibro homes in these areas, which now in these places are the domain of fairly socially um, disadvantaged people in a lot of cases. Um, and so I was just wondering if you had any views on, but do you think we're doing disaster relief, particularly from cyclones and floods, better these days for socially disadvantaged people who are um, the most affected? In some ways, Cyclone Tracy changed everything in that it, it meant that the um, nation was compelled to develop a proper protocol. They were starting to think about a national protocol, but um, Cycl Cyclone Tracy did, you know, kind of consolidated that. And certain things like evacuation would not be handled in the same way. People would be evacuated, but then they'd be allowed back in quite quite soon. And building codes have improved. In Darwin, actually, a lot of the older buildings survived and the newer ones didn't because um, the, it was growing so rapidly in the, late, in the late 60s and 70s, the houses were being thrown up pretty quickly. Um, but what happened then, which probably doesn't happen now, is that people were so shocked by what happened to Darwin. and. Uh, I think I say what the figure was, but I've, I've actually gone blank. But the, the government threw millions and millions and millions of dollars into rebuilding Darwin. And I think as there are more and more disasters, there is governments probably feel less able to kind of contribute to the re federal government to contribute to the rebuild to the same degree. And one of the, one, when I was writing about what happened to indigenous people, um, it became clear that there's still not proper protocol around the um, evacuation of Indigenous people, for example. Um, and a lot of Indigenous people live in remote areas which are more likely to be hit by these kind of events. So some um, changes aren't really happening um, as quickly as you, as you would like and things are probably... So things in some ways are getting better, but in some ways I think they're, they're getting worse. And I know that that's probably contributed to by discussions with insurance companies, and those, so fewer and fewer people are getting insurance. A lot of people actually seem to have insurance, I think, in Cyclone Tracy, and the government also did a stopgap thing where they actually helped people rebuild their houses. It, they, they got fixed interest rates that um, were quite... In fact, a couple of people came up to me in Darwin and talked about the people that got, you know, you get a fixed interest rate in 1978, which really helped quite dramatically when interest rates were, went up to 80% or whatever they did in, in, in the um, early 80s. Mm, I think there are still a, a lot of socially 
um, disadvantaged people who are falling through the cracks in the wakes, wake of these types of um, Certainly disasters. that's been the case in bushfires. Um, yeah. And then there's been... A, but, um, yeah, I think in general the welfare is getting more and more squeezed and the kind mm. of support for socially disadvantaged is, is going... is. Um, is becoming less efficient, but maybe that there are some people who are working harder to kind of create better protocols. So, um, but I suspect that problem won't go away as much as there's going to be government rhetoric about we'll do it differently next time. What mm. seems to happen is people don't do it so differently next time. Yeah. Which and is the, very and the only other comment I'd make is that you talked about, or your account of the the cyclone, included the gentleman um, talking about the projectile like a javelin. Yeah. Um, and I um, was very interested. I went into a, a government office um, up, up in um, south of Innisfail in a place called South Johnston um, after Cyclone Larry, and they've got a beautiful hunk of palm trunk, a, a big fat palm trunk, and just sort of cut off a section of it, and it has a fence paling embedded it's, in it. It's, it's extraordinary. That happened in the cyclone. The yeah. twist, the bits of twisted man metal you mm. still see. There's a pub, there was a pub, it closed when I was writing the book called the Mandura pub across um, the Darwin um, harbour that had just this kind of big piece of twisted metal that kind of mm. sat there. It was hard to really believe that wind, wind could do the kind of things it did. Most people died and most of the damage done was by these new buildings breaking up very quickly and that kind of debris swirling around. So, um, the building, yeah, so it was that, that, that image of a blender, what didn't just happen within houses, it seemed to be happening in the city itself really, there was a lot of corrugated iron flying around everywhere. Yes, one more. Um, might seem a strange question, but I'm just curious, given the time that's gone since then, and given the fact that probably a lot of the houses in Darwin that were destroyed were built with asbestos, whether there's any ongoing research as to what's happening to the people who survived it but may well have been subjected or breathed in asbestos fibres. I didn't read anything about that. I did read about um, higher rate of heart attacks and, and general health problems, which doesn't, it didn't just happen after Cyclone Tracy. It tends to happen after, um, after disasters in general. People cope, but then there's a, they have health, health problems later. I haven't actually read anything about asbestos. I was actually, sorry if I can, just reading this morning that um, uh, asbestos removalists have just arrived in Elko Island to deal with the uh, a, a big asbestos problem there after LAM two weeks ago. So I think it, you know, it must be a health issue, but it's hard to... Yeah. Well, I mean, they very quickly built a lot of buildings in the early 80s called um, called trauma bunkers was yeah. the nickname for them, which were these kind of very closed houses that were safe in a cyclone, but sort of horrible to live in in terms of getting air, any air through and you had to have air conditioners on all the time. But then now... They've now come up with a kind of the more modern buildings, as in the last 10 years, have been sort of tropical but sort of str stronger. So things are improving, but I don't know enough about... A lot of the Housing Commission flats didn't... The Housing Commission buildings, which are often the, the public servant houses, didn't go in the cyclone. They actually stood their ground, the ones that were built in the 40s and 50s. Um, you know, I think a lot of the questions are around how communities survive these kind of disasters and um, I really think that these kind of things and collating people's stories and the work that the archives did in collecting the stories and the work that you've done to bring them together, especially where now we can follow the hashtag for Cyclone Larm and kind of see what's going on and we didn't have that. So I really think that it's a, such an um, amazing contribution to both understanding this event um, in Australian history, but also to understanding what, what will come. So mm. thank you so much to, for coming today and for enlightening us and for writing this book. Um, I would just uh, want to wrap today by just saying a couple of things. Firstly, I would encourage you all to buy and read Sophie's book. She'll be signing it right now over there at the book signing. I would also encourage you all to, when you're in the book tent, just buy one extra book. This is an incredible free event. Um, it's uh, the, we really rely on the sales from the book tent, so don't think, oh, I'll buy that somewhere else or I'll buy it online. Um, just think of it as being like a cost for a movie or something like that. So I would encourage you all to do that. Um, I would um, once more ask you to thank Sophie Cunningham for being with us today. Mm.